African leadership was able to galvanize and unite around this idea of total political independence, and this mission was achieved. In the second major challenge facing Africa, the idea of economic independence, there is a perception that leadership is lacking, weak, or completely absent. But is this assessment fair? What are the actual leadership challenges facing Africa, and what can be done about them? Joining us today on the program to discuss these and other leadership challenges facing the continent is His Excellency President Thabo Mbeki of South Africa. Your Excellency, welcome back to the program. No, thanks. So I just want to start very briefly with a bit of a historical overview. We've seen African leadership be able to galvanize towards a common objective with independence in particular. What happened? Why have we somehow, or why do we at least perceive that we have somehow lost this ability to galvanize around a united issue, an issue that it really affects us all? No, I don't think, I think that assessment would be wrong to say that uh, the, uh, we've lost that capacity. Uh, you'd remember, for instance, that uh, in, in 2013, uh, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the foundation of the Organization of, of African Unity, the OAU. Uh, and during that celebration, there was this issue arose, the question that you are raising. Uh, what, what should be the focal uh, points of attention of, of, of the continent? And uh, the decision was, and the necessary declarations were made and statements and so on, uh, that really we need to focus on two matters. One was the African Renaissance. Second was African unity. So we had formal, discussed, and agreed positions by the political leadership on the continent to say, uh, these are the two strategic challenges we face. How do we promote the renaissance of Africa? How do we promote African unity? That was 2013. And then subsequent to that, <clears throat> there was then the adoption of, as you know, this Agenda 2063, which is, uh, what's our vision uh, of Africa 50 years after the establishment of the OAU? Given that we've said Renaissance unity, we needed to elaborate a, a more practical program to achieve those objectives, which is what Agenda 2063 is about. And as you would know, therefore, the, that Agenda 2063 addresses all of the, the major areas uh, of change that are required on the continent, the politics, the economy, questions of peace and security, other things. So we have a comprehensive vision for 2063 with the attendant decision that then you also therefore had to look at the, the practical steps that you would take in order to arrive at whatever that vision said, 50 years from 2013. Uh, so the, the, therefore, the, in terms of the implementation of Agenda 2063 is then broken into 10-year periods from 2013 to 2023. What do we want to achieve? Where do we want to get to in terms of this? For instance, you know that uh, the, the, one of the decisions that was taken was that the way it is put, is that we must silence the guns by 2020. Which means, therefore, the continent commits itself to attend to all of these issues which have caused conflict on the continent since independence. Uh, what is it that we do so that by 2020, within the context of that 2063, uh, you have significantly broken the back of this thing which causes, causes uh, uh, war, instability, conflict on the continent. So, it's, uh, so the vision is there. And I think the, 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 the more practical steps in order to realize the vision, that the decisions have been taken on that already. 
And this reflects a commitment. Uh, if I can just mention this, that this, in that context, uh, we had to uh, prepare a report uh, on a matter that had been identified by the African Finance and Economic Development Ministers, which was that the, uh, the continent was losing large volumes of, of capital, of uh, money that could be used for investment on the continent uh, through illicit outflows. Uh, so they asked us to constitute a panel to look at this matter uh, to see what it is that needed to be done. We submitted that report uh, at the AU summit in 2015. It was adopted and then the heads of state then also adopted a declaration on the matter which commits the member states uh, of the African Union to actually to deal, to act, to deal with the matter of the illicit outflows, to stop them. And uh, we were then asked as a panel to give an annual report uh, to the African Union summit about what the member states actually practically are doing to realize that objective of stopping these outflows of capital. And so that every year, the AU is able to have, a, to make an assessment. What is the progress that's being made? What are the problems? What is it that we need to do to make sure that we actually achieve this objective? So the point really I'm trying to emphasize is that in the context of that 50 year vision, from 2030 to 2063, the additional important decision was taken that that needs to be broken down into practical programs of, of work, as is reflected in the decision to end the conflicts by 2020 and deal with this matter of the illicit outflows and provide annual reports so that the organization can deal with these matters. So we have this vision. We have now 10-year plans, from what, from what I'm understanding as well. Why then is there this perception that for some reason Africa has a leadership problem or a leadership challenge? Do you think that's a fair perception to have? Do you think it's an unfair criticism? And, and why does it exist, if at all? No, I think that one of, this, one of the problems anyway with regard to the work that the continent is doing as a continent. I think there is poor communication about that. Uh, for instance, just to come back to this matter I've just mentioned, I don't know how many, there is a lot of, there's a actually very high level of consciousness uh, on the continent, never mind the rest of the world, uh, a high level of consciousness about the matter of the illicit financial outflows. Great familiarity that there is this challenge and we must do something about it. But I, I would bet that there are very, very few Africans who know that there was an additional decision that uh, the AU would then have an annual report of progress made. It's a lack of communication. Uh, because that knowledge would convey to all of us, the Africans as a whole, that our leadership are actually doing something that the, the, the perception that there's an absence of leadership, nothing is being done, is in fact wrong. And I think you can take the various elements uh, of the major issues, and I think you can show that in fact the leadership is acting. So I'm saying that there is a, a, a communication problem that the continent is not effectively communicating what it is doing uh, with regard to all of these various matters that uh, it's, it's attending to. The, uh, the UN uh, took a decision uh, last year to do a review of peacekeeping. 
so the Secretary General constituted a group of the United Nations, a constituted a group to look at this matter with a view to making recommendations as to what did the United Nations need to do in order to improve that capacity. Now, the, the African Union was a bit concerned about the, They accepted that it was necessary to do this review. But what was of concern to the continent was that uh, the bulk of uh, UN peacekeeping takes place on the African continent. But in terms of the review processes uh, uh, put in place by the Secretary General of the United Nations, they felt that the process had been constituted in a manner which did not take into account the fact that the continent of Africa is the principal subject globally of this. And therefore took a decision that we ourselves as the continent should do our own parallel assessment of the same peacekeeping matter so that we can then make, a, make a, a proposals from an African perspective. That's been done, uh, and the report has been launched uh, in the last two weeks in Addis Ababa. Again, it's a very important report about how to handle peacekeeping on the continent. And it emphasizes a very important issue, which is uh, you shouldn't only intervene by sending in peacekeepers uh, to stop a conflict. You, you need a political intervention in the first instance to prevent the conflicts taking place. And if they've taken place, sure, of course you've got to send in peacekeepers. But the peacekeepers, the peacekeeping operation must be accompanied by a political intervention to address the root causes of the conflict. So that by the time you say, okay, the guns have stopped firing, uh, maybe government of national unity has been formed, uh, there's no more killing, therefore the peacekeepers must leave. That must be accompanied by this political outcome. The peacekeepers leave not simply because the guns have stopped firing, but because the matter of the cause of the conflict has also been addressed. Now, uh, again, I'm giving that as an example that uh, I suspect that there, again, has not been sufficient communication by the African Union uh, to the African public that in terms even of issues like uh, peacekeeping, what does peacekeeping mean? Practically, what should happen? Uh, peacekeeping in Somalia now, peacekeeping in uh, South Sudan, peacekeeping in Sudan, peacekeeping in Central African Republic, you know, all over. Uh, that as Africans who are saying, what we must as Africa make these political interventions to make sure that, as I was saying, not only do the guns stop firing, but we actually address the matter of the root causes of that. Again, this requires communication to the African people so that then Africa can see that there are actually practical steps that have been taken by the leadership to confront these, these, these various issues. So there are kind of two things I want to, to come back to from what you've just said. On, on the one hand, this issue of, of communicating, is that what is leading to a kind of a lack of buy-in, which then gives us this perception that sure. there is no leadership. It's, it's kind of one point. And the second is a slightly different tack. Um, again, on, on this question of, of the leadership previously as it, as it is compared to today, whether fairly or unfairly, there is an argument out there that says, you know, the first generation of African leadership was about political independence, and that has been achieved. The second generation of leadership, if we can call it that, was now about economic independence, and this has not been achieved yet. First, do you agree with that assessment? Um, and second of all, if yes, why are people not seeing that? And if, if no, what more needs to be done in order to, to get to at least a place where we feel as though we have achieved that economic independence that we, that we talk about? 
Well, I mean, it would be correct to say uh, uh, the African continent, let's say the OAU, as uh, its principal African continental task, it was this task of the achievement of the total liberation of the continent. So independence for everybody. And indeed, the, 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 the continent acted in unity uh, on that thing. There might have been a few exceptions, but essentially the continent acted in unity, and that objective was achieved. Bearing in mind that, in a sense, even conceptually, it's a, it's a much easier matter to deal with, easier in this sense. Take the Portuguese colonies. You've got a Portuguese colonial power, and then you've got the liberation movements. In the, in, the, in the Portuguese colonies. And their task, the liberation movements, which they set themselves, is independence for Mozambique, for Angola, for Cap Verde, and Guinea-Bissau, and so on. Uh, we must defeat Portuguese colonialism and achieve independence. And that's all. Or Zimbabwe, or South Africa, or Namibia, and so on. These are, I'm saying they're straightforward conceptually. There might be difficult struggles since they take a long time, they cost a lot of lives and so on. But it's very easy to rally people together to say, let's, let's do this. And I think a second element to this is those struggles by their nature involve the citizens. It's the citizens of Angola and Mozambique, etc., of South Africa and Zimbabwe, Namibia, who, who engage in struggle. The independent states, as governments, they intervene to support. And even the populations. I mean, if you take, for instance, uh, in Nigeria, during the course of that struggle, Nigeria set up a whole system of uh, uh, donations by the population to a central fund in order to assist the liberation movements. So in that case, you have the government supporting the struggle. You have the population supporting the struggle via those contributions, etc. Now, so I'm saying in, the, in that sense, uh, it's relatively easy, only in that sense, uh, to rally around the matter of the liberation struggle. The economic struggle is a very complex process. What happened was, uh, at the same time as the liberation wars were going on, you'd recall that the OAU uh, adopted uh, the Lagos Plan of Action, which is about the economic issues. What do we do in order to achieve economic independence, economic development and economic integration, all of those issues. But history had proved that in reality it was not possible for the continent actually to implement in full the program that it had agreed upon dealing with this economic transformation. It was really largely because, in my view, uh, you couldn't do it while so much of the continent was still under colonial rule. Uh, so, uh, so in that sense, it was then put on the back burner. Yeah. Let's attend to this principal matter of the total liberation of the continent. As soon as that was done, you would recall that as soon as South Africa was liberated from apartheid, the continent got together again to say, let's go back to this matter of the economic challenge. Which is why you then had the OAU uh, approving uh, NAPAT, uh, which included many of the elements in the Lagos Plan of Action. Uh, because it was now saying, now that we've completed the task of the political liberation, let's go back to this task. So uh, the matter was therefore not forgotten of the economic liberation, development, etc. So there was a plan of action. Adopted, institutions put in place to pursue this matter. 
which remains a matter still on the agenda. Now, NEPAD continues, and the political views, the, not the political views, well, it's certainly the, the politics of NEPAD and, and the, the practical things that need to be done, with infrastructure development, industrialization, and all that, are part of Agenda 2063. So I'm saying for a poli from a policy point of view, the continent has not relaxed its focus on that matter. Now, when you then come to the practical outcomes, I, th I think it's, uh, it, it's necessary to, to understand that you are dealing with a much more complex problem in terms of t getting outcomes to say, okay, now we have achieved our economic independence. It's a more complex pro uh, process than getting your political independence. Plus, uh, the, whereas with regard to the liberation struggles, you would get the ordinary African people involved both in the countries that are fighting and in the countries that are supporting, you'd get the involvement of the population. With regard to the economic struggle, it becomes more challenging to get that popular participation. So you'd get the population a, a kind of a distance developing between what the leadership is thinking and saying and what the masses of the people know. Mm -hmm. As, so that will be a problem. In addition to which I'm saying we are dealing with a much longer process. We can discuss any element uh, of uh, uh, the economic struggle. And, and it would be quite easy to see that you could never achieve any of the objectives that you'll set on the economic issue with the same speed that you would achieve your, econ your, your political liberation. So you couldn't say a struggle for the liberation of Mozambique, the armed struggle started in 1961, 62, and by 1975, Mozambique was independent. Yeah. Uh, 10 years, 13 years or something. And therefore, why don't we get economic independence for Mozambique in 13 years? You can't. You are dealing with two different quantities, two different issues. The political, the economic struggle is bound to take longer. Now, uh, and then, uh, and it takes place within a global context, that economic struggle. If you take, for instance, uh, what's happening now, a lot of the continent, as you know, uh, produces uh, commodities of various sorts and exports those. Uh, and they become a very important element in terms of the economic development of the continent. But you've seen what's, what's happened uh, with commodities in the last two years or so. The prices have gone down. So whatever plans the Africans had maybe based on the price of coal and gold and diamonds and other that, 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 five years ago. Those plans will have to change because the prices have changed very radically. So I'm saying that the struggle to, to achieve the economic objectives will be more complex, will take longer than the political struggle. And the ability of the population to see progress is more difficult. Uh, you have to, again, it is partly a problem of communication. To say, you remember last year or two years ago, we did not have a tarred road between town A and town B. The reason we're able to tar this road is because of the economic resources that we're able to generate. The reason that we've got, we, yesterday we had one university, now we've got five. And the reason we support five universities, again, is because of the economic development, and therefore we to be able to take more younger people, younger people in a big, bigger numbers, to get into higher education or that kind of thing. But again, I'm, I'm sure that kind of communication is not being done. So if I am poor, I was poor five years ago, I remain poor today. It's, it's quite legitimate for me to say, therefore, no progress has been made. 
But I'm saying it may very well be that what has happened during that period, we've increased the intake of university students by 100%. That's progress. But for me, who's poor, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I, mean, I remain poor. No progress. But maybe you should communicate to say, but we've created, you are a poor family. You were five years ago, you remain poor. Uh, therefore, we've made no progress with regard to that. But the fact of the matter is your children have now got a much better opportunity to get to university and lead lives that are different from yours. You, you see what I'm trying to get at. But it's much more difficult thing to communicate, uh, but even practically, to give examples of the progress that is being achieved on the economic front. It is not as, as easy to demonstrate as during the course of a liberation struggle. Mozambique, we've stayed with that example, to say we started the struggle like that, that, that. but now look, uh, the province of Nyasa has now been liberated, we've driv driven away the Portuguese. The Teta province has now, we've got a liberated area. So you can see visibly progress is being achieved. Progress on the economic front can be of that nature. But uh, I, I think the uh, uh, the focus has not been lost. The work is going on. In a, in a difficult global situation, because you cannot detach the African economy from the rest of the global economy. It's not possible. Uh, so it will therefore, that e global economic situation will impact on the domestic African situation. So it's a much more complex task, but I think, again, maybe it is a responsibility of our governments to communicate more regularly with the population what is being done, and truthfully, honestly, what are we doing, what are the problems, what progress are we making, what reverses are we suffering, what are we going to do about this, and, uh, and engage the population in a discussion of that kind. And as, a, as a kind of final conceptual question, as it were, this issue of, of the Pan-Africanism, again, it's slightly related to the, the liberation movements, but now the idea of Pan-Africanism moving into the economic struggle. Is that something that is possible? Or is the idea of Pan-Africanism kind of lived out its purpose? Can, can, they, can it translate across so that we can say, look, in order for us to industrialize, there will have to be winners and losers in the short term at least, but collectively we're all better off in the longer term. Can Pan-Africanism as a concept, as, as a language, as a discourse, fill that space? Or is that idea one that we should say it lived its purpose, we need something new for these new and more complex challenges? No, no, I'd say it's, uh, it's very, very directly relevant, the matter of Pan-Africanism and therefore the issue of, of African unity uh, is, is, is very it's critically important in terms of the economic development. So the emphasis on the continent, on, on regional economic integration, uh, and therefore the existence of the regional economic communities it is important. As, and I think the expression is correct, that uh, you need those regional economic communities, whether it's the East African community, or SADC, or COMESA, or, or ECOWAS, and so on, as building blocks to get to deal with the matter of economic integration on a continental level. And therefore, the step that was taken uh, to try and integrate Comesa, the East African community, SADC, Southern African Development Community, those three. Documents, as you know, have been signed and since agreed. You are using those regional economic, economic communities as those building blocks. And now we reach the stage where at least those three, in terms of the documentation, that's been agreed. You need a process of ratification and, 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 and so on. And then the implementation part. So uh, because it is obvious that uh, in terms of current economies, you, you need for one thing, you need bigger markets. And small countries with a population of 2 million, 3 million, 5, 
these are too small and could never be able to cope economically acting on their own. To say that let's, let's act within a pan-African spirit, that we, we share a common destiny as Africans. And, and therefore, let's, let's cooperate on an equal basis so that in even the, 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 the notion of a balanced economic development must be achieved and balanced means that you must have shared progress, whether you're a big country or a small country, but the progress is shared. That has to be informed by this Pan-African attitude. That as Africans, we need this Pan-African attitude in order to be able to address our economic challenges. So that even when you see you deal with uh, Africa and the rest of the world, like, look at the, the Europeans, EU, as an economic bloc. Uh, the North Americans and, and, and Mexico are in NAFTA. Japan, US, uh, Mexico is in NAFTA. You've got bloc, bloc, uh, blocks like this. Or the ASEAN countries, Southeast Asia. Uh, the continent has got to act as a bloc in order to make sure that the continent achieves its own rightful place within that global economic setting. And again, that Pan-African idea, uh, African unity, the capacity of the continent to act together, both in terms of how it represents itself in the context of the rest of the world, and how it impacts on its own internal continental development challenges. You, you, can't, you can't do without that notion of African unity dri driven by this Pan-African spirit. I'm insisting on it because it has to be based on, on, a, on a doctrine of, of equal treatment, mutual benefit. As I was saying, not uh, I'm a bigger country, and therefore I'm going to dictate the rest. And the economic benefits, I will develop because I'm a big guy and you will suffer. You know, it can't be. That's contrary to, to any, any Pan-African spirit. So no, it is very, very vital, this. But I'm saying in practice, the insistence on the regional economic communities and regional integration is correct. Uh, the use of those, the internet must not exist uh, for their own sake. They are important for the region, but they are important also as building blocks to this larger whole, which is a continent. Uh, so I'm saying even on a practical basis, therefore, uh, even if we said, let's just talk about the continental economy on its own, uh, it would be better, it would make more sense uh, for Tanzania uh, to produce sugar, for instance, and sell to a bigger market uh, on the continent, because you remove the trade barriers and so on. Uh, it, it means uh, your sugar industry here would be much more vibrant, much more competitive, uh, much more economic, because you're dealing with a bigger market. So I'm saying even in the context of addressing the, 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 the continental economic challenges, that Pan-African approach is important, as much as it is important in terms of how Africa deals with the rest of the world. So it is, it is very fundamental. Not, it was not only fundamental in the context of the liberation struggles, it's, it's very important in context of these economic struggles uh, because without it, uh, we can't succeed. Just as a kind of summary and in, in wrapping, so what I'm hearing from you is the leadership is committed. It's going in the right direction. We have the vision. We have the plans. There may be a communication challenge in sure, particular. Certainly but is. at least yeah. you feel that Africa, we're, we're going in the right direction. Um, but you see, I mean, the, I think an important point to make in that context is... Uh, the communication thing. Part of the problem uh, that you are raising, quite correctly, of a perception among the Africans 
of a weak leadership or an absence of leadership on the continent is that uh, I think you have very few uh, of our political leaders on the continent who actually act visibly as champions of these issues. Uh, so that, you know, an ordinary citizen in South Africa, in, 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 in Tanzania, and Burkina um, Faso, whatever, you know, when you say, but who is talking about the need to eradicate poverty on the continent? People who scratch their heads and say, uh, uh, we haven't had anybody. It may very well be that there's enormous effort that is going into this thing, but there's no visible champions. And so you can't see that, in fact, this is a matter that our leadership is attending to. I think that's part of the problem. Uh, the, many of our heads of state, you only see them in terms of the media, uh, commenting on domestic issues, which they must do. It's correct, they have to address, their, they must address domestic issues. But very few that you then see that uh, they are addressing continental issues uh, and issues that have got to do with even this question we're talking about, relations between Africa and the rest of the world. So I think the leadership uh, on the continent, the political leadership at least, has, has to address that matter. Uh, to say the, the, the people need to see visibly that we are standing up for certain Pan-African values, we are standing up for certain uh, Pan-African programs. Uh, and that will help to say to the population, our leadership are attending to this. But if you look around now, uh, I'm saying it'd be very, very difficult to, to be able to identify uh, which African leaders are in fact taking up these Pan-African issues. It's not because they're not doing it, uh, but the, the visibility and the communication with the population is, I think, very weak. I must also say that the, uh, also the involvement of the population. You know, I was talking about the decisions taken on uh, uh, the peace and security question, silence the guns, uh, remodel peacekeeping, and, and so on. Uh, in both in that kind of approach, fortunately, you have quite a strong insistence on the involvement of the population in making for peace. Uh, like women, there must be a conscious uh, intervention to ensure that the masses of the women in our countries that are in conflict are involved in finding peace because they tend to be the majority of the civilians who suffer from this conflict, women. And that's important. In the, in the struggle on the matter of the illicit financial flows, that's one of the things that we've insisted on, the involvement of civil society. So the NGOs are part of this process. You know, don't just say governments deal with this, but the population. I think it's very important to do this across the board that helps to say to the population, therefore we as a continent are dealing with this thing because practically we are involved in addition to the role I'm talking about of the leadership. But I think the involvement of the ordinary Africans in these struggles is, is a critically important part. And we'd like to end the program just with giving you an opportunity to share any final thoughts you might have on, on your take of leadership in Africa or African leadership as a concept. You know, it's, uh, it, the African continent is not going to change for the better in any of its elements, whether you are talking politics, economy, gender issue, uh, development of the youth, rights of the child, all of these things. Unless the population, we, as the Africans, you know the old slogan, we must be our own liberators, we the people. So the people must get that sense that they are also their own liberators in terms of the struggle for economic independence, uh, which means involvement. 
And therefore, there needs to be uh, some slogans uh, that become a very important part of our consciousness. So if the, when you wake me up in the middle of the night and you say to me, uh, what do you think we should be doing as, as Africans? I must be saying there must be peace, there must be democracy, there must be eradication of poverty, there must be gender equality. All billion of us must be able to say that. So the continent has got a very clear view about where it wants to get to. Not a 10 hour speech, but uh, this here are these objectives in the public consciousness on the basis of which you then do your mobilization, on the basis of which you then provide this visible leadership. That's what I would say. As of now, I think if you woke me up in the middle of the night and said to me, give me five principal objectives uh, that the continent must achieve, it might take me 10 hours to explain to you. And that means there's something wrong. Well, on that note, I want to thank you very much for being on the program again and welcoming you back again whenever you are free to do so. Thanks. Thank you.